Hello, I'm Des Dearlove. Welcome to the Thinkers 50 studio in the heart of London. My guest today is Roger Martin. Roger is the Dean at the Rotman School of Business in Toronto, and he's also no stranger to Thinkers 50. We've been following his career for a number of years. He is currently ranked number six in the Thinkers 50 rankings. Roger's new book is called Playing to Win, How Strategy Really Works, and he's written it with A.G. Laffley, former chairman of Procter & Gamble. Roger, welcome. It's great to be here, Dad. Well, let's start with the new book. I mean, the interesting thing is that you've written it with A.G. Laffley. Tell us a little bit about the big idea behind the book. Well, the big idea is you can make strategy simple, fun, and effective. I don't think many people would say their strategy process, the, the job of putting together a strategy for the company is any one of those three things. And A.G. and I uh, have a belief that you, you can make strategy very simple, it can be enjoyable to do and very effective. And so we wrote a book about what we did together uh, to do that at Procter & Gamble. Again, one of the motivators for, for writing the book is that we find that not many executives, I think, really have a, a definition of strategy that's helpful to them. And so they do lots of analysis, put together very thick documents that sit on shelves, quite famously. Uh, and it's because they haven't made the few key choices. And so what we distilled it down to in our, in our practice is five key choices. And if you make those choices, you'll have a strategy. If you haven't made those choices, your strategy is basically probably not worth having. Now at the Thinkers 50, we're really interested in where the tires of theory really meet the pavement of practice, as it were. So in a way, this book is the perfect example of that. It embodies that. It's, it's, it's a seasoned and very successful practitioner in A.G. Laffley and yourself coming from the academic world and coming from the world of consulting. So how did that collaboration really come about? Well, when he took over as CEO of Procter in June of 2000, he phoned me up and said, we've got a lot of challenges and things we, things we need to do. And I'd known him for about 10 years uh, prior to that, working on various projects at, uh, at Procter. And he asked me, would I work with him as a, as sort of a counselor and advisor on strategy? And we worked together for the entire time. Uh, he was CEO uh, and chair of Procter and worked on in, in, kind of instilling in P&G a discipline about strategy that he, he had always believed needed to be there. Um, and it, it turned out that we kind of worked together, we learned together, and we thought we should share uh, the, the results of that collaboration. So it really is the real deal. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and I think your, your point about rubber meeting the road, uh, it, absolutely. That, that's, we think that the stories that we can tell about Proctor, they're not, they're not just a consultant going in from the outside and, and interviewing a few people. It's we actually did it and did it together in a real environment. And, and so we think it has, a, it has an authenticity to it that, that I think is, is maybe a bit unique. So tell us about the five questions and how they fit together. Sure. Uh, the most important thing about the five questions is that, is that they have to be answered together uh, in, a, in a way that reinforce one another. Uh, uh, so each of the five questions actually isn't all that hard to answer on its own. It's a little bit harder to answer them in a way that, that fits together. But the first question is, what is your winning aspiration? So what are you trying to accomplish uh, with, with your strategy? If you don't have that sense of an objective function, uh, it's going to be hard to have a useful strategy. Um, now, many companies will have high polluting, as you said, high pollutant aspirations, uh, but those are not then linked to the key choices, which, which we call the heart of strategy, where to play and how to win. So given your aspirations, where do you want to play in whatever space whatever market space uh, you're looking at, and then where, once you've chosen that, how do you want to win where you've chosen to play? Then the fourth choice is, okay, what capabilities do I need to have to build, to maintain, to win in the place I've chosen to play so that I can achieve my aspirations? And then finally, the last of the fifth, uh, five questions is, what management systems do I have to have in place so that I have the capabilities built and maintained so that I can win where I've chosen to play and meet my aspirations. It's those five questions that a company needs to answer to have a strategy. The good news is there's no good reason why you can't describe that in five pages or less. So you don't need a thick deck. Five pages will do it. In fact, you should be able to summarize it on, on one page. 
Uh, and, but the key is that though the great strategies are ones where those five things uh, fit together and reinforce uh, one another. Okay, can you give us an example of that? Well, uh, and, and we talk about in, in, in the book the example of Olay and the transformation from oil of Olay, a slow-growing, uh, low-price uh, uh, product with an aging, aging demographic, and uh, so that's the brand uh, that that we looked at starting uh, as as AG took over the beauty category in the late in the late '90s, but then continuing uh, through his presidency. Um, and and we looked at that and said, what are our aspirations for the skincare category? Well, it turns out it's in beauty. It is the biggest and most profitable category, a fifty billion dollar business worldwide. Procter really wanted to get bigger in beauty. It al already had, uh, had shampoos and, and uh, conditioners and a little fragrance business, but it wanted to make that very big. And so our aspiration for that was to, rather than make it a little sidelight where we had this one brand, $750 million uh, brand, not very important, low price, the aspiration was to make skincare a centerpiece of a beauty t uh, strategy by having, by having a leading brand in skincare. But then we had a look and, and asked the question, where were we currently playing? Well, what we were playing is with aging women, and our demographic was, was aging, in the sort of wrinkle, wrinkle prevention, uh, wrinkle cover-up uh, category. A and our product was uh, sold for about $3.99 uh, uh, for one little bottle of uh, pink fluid. Uh, and, and we said, well, is there another where to play? that would would open up opportunities for us and what we came to the conclusion of is that there was a demographic that was younger women aged 35 to 49 who were observing the first signs of aging and were were, were interested in something that helped them with the uh, signs of aging not just wrinkles but drier skin uh, uh, spots uh, blemishes and the like S what we came to call the seven signs of aging um, and we said, if we instead chose our wear as for these very sort of skin-involved uh, uh, women who are of a younger demographic, that we wouldn't be going dead at the heart of the, of the category. Um, and then we said, well, how, how can we win with, with, uh, with these uh, women? And what we realized is that we had to take up the product dramatically in, in quality, reposition it uh, as a as a, a substitute for what they'd paid really big bucks for in the department store uh, channel. Uh, and that we had to work with our, uh, our retail partners to create a kind of a section in the store that made it feel more like the department store channel, but was in the store that the buyer was in on a regular basis and also didn't have the pressure of the salesperson at the, at the department store trying to sell you more and more and more uh, uh, stuff. Um, and so we had to build capabilities uh, to uh, better packaging, uh, you know, better active in ingredients. We had to build all sorts of relationships with the beauty editors and the magazines to, to take our product uh, seriously. Um, and we ended up launching uh, Olay Total Effects. We also dropped the oil of, made it Olay, Olay Total Effects at $18.99 which is a stunningly high price point. So oil of Olay, $3.99, Olay total effects, $18.99. Uh, but it was positioned against, in a different place, against a, a sort of a different wear, a very different how to win, some capabilities that were built, uh, built behind, uh, behind that. And it's ended up growing uh, at a 10 to 15% rate for over a decade and is now by far the biggest skincare brand in the world. And probably, it's hard to, hard to tell exactly, but probably one of the most uh, profitable. And it's a two and a half billion dollar and growing uh, business now. All because we set an aspiration, picked a different wear, figured out exactly how you had to win, built the capabilities and the management systems uh, around that. And that's, that's doable, we believe that's doable in any business, as long as you're willing to address those questions and, and, and really have an aspiration for winning rather than just playing. We were just playing and now we're winning.
I think one of the one of the big learning points for me was that was this notion that this these five questions it's not a linear process is it? it it's very much an iterative process with one part informing the rest and reinforcing the others can you say a little bit about that yeah that, that's a super important point uh, des uh, uh, if you, there are so many companies that that I've ob observed make it very linear and one of the one of the uh, expressions of that is starting out a strategy process with a long and involved and often painful wordsmithing exercise about what's our vision and mission. Uh, and, and the reason that it takes so long often and there are so many fights is it's really hard to tell what your aspiration should be until you know a little bit more about the where to play and, and how to win. So you might set your aspiration as, as something that you cannot find a where to play and how to win that meet that. But if you've already locked and loaded on it and had this whole exercise where we've now got the new you know, vision or we've got the new aspiration, it's hard to then say, uh-oh, we've got to go back. And so what, what, what we say when we're doing during strategy is set an initial aspiration, then see about a where to play, how to win. If you can't find a where to play, how to win that's consistent with that, maybe go back and revisit it. You could try and you create an initial where to play, how to, how to win, then ask, can we really build the capabilities to win in that way? Oh, maybe not quite. Okay, so we're going to have to tweak it a little bit. So you're right. It's this, it's this iterative process where the key is to frame it that way, to not have everybody say, oh no, this is terrible. We've now got to go back and revisit. No, no, no. That's a good part of strategy. That's a great part of strategy. It's what makes strategy uh, powerful. I mean, but Boris, some, some, some from, some, I mean, AG and I are both really interested in the world of design. And it, it borrows some from that. You prototype your strategy decision, right? And then, and then you loop back and say, based on what's happened when we've exposed the prototype to, to, to people, we say, ah, you know, that's sort of right, but not quite. And you have that attitude toward, toward strategy. So it doesn't feel like failure. It feels like getting it better and better and better. I think another of the messages of the book is that, is that strategy isn't just for people who are up in the boardroom, that, that everybody should be doing strategy, whether you're a brand manager or in charge of a business unit, you should be doing your own strategy. But also that strategy needs to be done in the context of what the company is trying to do, in, in the context of the corporate strategy. So how does that work? Tell us a little bit about this nesting notion where, the, where these things fit together. Absolutely. Yeah, I think at every level in a corporation. So at Procter & Gamble, they have to make uh, uh, strategy decisions, have a where to play, how to win, at the, an aspiration at the corporate level, at the beauty care level, for, for instance, at, at the skin care level, at the individual uh, brand level. Uh, and, and I encourage uh, the, the people I work with, whatever level they're at, is ask the question, well, kind of what is your aspiration for the, the part of this company that you're, you are in charge of? Even if it's just a one little department, what's the aspiration? What is your where to play, how to win uh, a choice? I would even go so far as to say every single person in an organization would be wise to have a where to play, how to win. Right? Like what of all the things, because job descriptions don't, aren't, aren't so specific as put your left foot in front of your right foot and your left, you know, they, they sort of say, well, here's your job, Des, here's, here's your job. And within that, you have a lot of choices as to, well, where exactly am I going to focus my, my time? How am I going to do that in a way that creates all sorts of value, right? That's, that's, that's winning. And, and so, the, but the only thing you have to think about in this nesting concept is, your where to play how to win had better reinforce and make make more powerful the where to play how to win choices of the unit above you and the unit above you and the unit above you um, and it and it's a concept that says rather than saying i'm going to make the strategy choices because i'm way above you high up in the organization and you're down below running a bit business uh, and you just execute it that no you have to make strategy choices too and, and if everybody felt that they have to make strategy choices, I think corporations would work a lot better than saying, no, 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 we make the choices up above and you people down there execute. It's not the way the world actually works and it's not a helpful kind of a conception of the corporation. Roger, some of the work you've been doing recently, you've also been looking at this notion of what you call actionable research, the difference between research that's coming out of business schools that's highly theoretical and research that really has an impact. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, it, and, and my interest in actionability comes from a wonderful man, Chris Argerus, one of the greatest management scholars of the, 
of the 20th century, who's, who's, who's aging, uh, aging now, he's in his 80s. Uh, but he, uh, his view uh, was that knowledge for which you cannot take action isn't particularly valuable knowledge. Um, and so uh, I guess I've always, I've always believed that. Uh, he's, he uh, pounded that into, into my head in a nice way. Um, and and all, of, all of the work that I, that, that I do, uh, I try to make it grounded in actually helping companies uh, do things. So lots of the work, lots of the things that I actually bring to the, to the Rotman School are things I've tried first with corporations and then I teach the students rather than teach the students and then hopefully corporations might be might be interested. Um, and I think it's something that's really important for the business school sector now. I think the business school sector is coming under under more criticism uh, for its research not being as actionable as it as it could be and and needs to be. Now I think part of that criticism is legitimate. I think I think the, the, uh, the Business Academy can do a better job of that. Part of it is not in that, in that some research that is done won't be actionable for 10 years or, or 20 years, but you have to do this basic, uh, basic research. But m my rule is, is I think every piece of research that a business professor does, he or she should have in his or her mind what problem for a real business could this solve? Maybe not immediately, but eventually. Uh, and if all business professors ask that question, rather than what's just interesting to me, what's interesting to my fellow academics, I think we'd have more actionability uh, of business uh, research in, in general, and that, and that criticism would, would fade. Now, obviously, you've been working in the, in the realm of strategy for a long time, but it's the first time you've really written a book on strategy. Um, it's interesting, too, that, that we're, we're at this very interesting point in the strategy debate where we've got a lot of people will have grown up, of course, with Michael Porter's Five Forces or the Boston Matrix. And now more recently, we've had notions of core competencies and blue ocean strategy. People like Rich Devaney and R Rita McGrath talking about the fact that competitive advantage is no longer sustainable over the long run. Where are we in this, in this strategy landscape? What do you make of it? Well, if I, if I kind of think about what, what what's going on in the world of strategy now. One thing I think that's, a, that's a, now a core theme is, is just getting strategy to be effective. So it's one thing for academics to admonish companies to say, well, you need to do strategy, you need to do strategy my way or some way or whatever, and then companies not doing uh, a strategy and, and not finding strategy particularly helpful. So there's one huge theme that I think of just making sure strategy is doable by companies, that, that they, can, they can address strategy questions and come to answers. And so one of the reasons for the book is to say, here's a way to just make it doable. Um, there then are these sort of theoretical uh, kind of debates, and, and I guess and, and, a, and, a, and a big one has to do with, with competitive advantage, uh, as, as, you, as you indicated. And um, I guess I, th I think a lot of the debate is not all that, all that helpful. Like, it is obvious uh, that competitive advantage exists in the world. It is also obvious that competitive advantage doesn't last forever. Right? Uh, and so the people who say, well, there's no such thing as sustainable competitive advantage because it doesn't last forever, it's sort of like, duh, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's obvious, you know, nothing lasts forever. Uh, but if you're trying to say that there is no such thing as competitive advantage, I think all the well-performing, super normally profitable uh, uh, companies who maintain that for years and years and years, it's sort of hard to say that's not competitive advantage. So the question to me becomes, is there a thinking process that can help managers make decisions that produce advantage, high amount of value created for customers uh, that enables you to make uh, you know, a, a, an attractive uh, return and opens up other possibilities to keep on renewing that? That's, that's the fundamental uh, question uh, I ask. And, and my view is, yes, there's, there's a process of, for thinking that's more likely to get you answers that say, here's an intelligent where to play, how to win, and 
if we make choices of that sort, um, we will position ourselves in a way that gives us the opportunity to keep modifying that and enhancing it ahead of, of, uh, of other people so that, so that we do have an advantage over a sustained period of time. It's not the same advantage, right? It actually could be different sorts of advantages over, or if you look over a 50 year period, it may actually be a whole bunch of different sorts of uh, uh, advantages, um, but it's because we have a practice of asking a set of questions that kind of keeps us ahead of the game rather than always being responsive uh, to it. So in some sense, I, 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 I don't care so much about pe people who say there isn't any ad advantage or there is or it's sustainable or it's positioning or it's static or whatever. I say the world isn't static, strategy isn't static, but that doesn't mean there isn't a way of thinking about the fundamental questions in a way that keeps you ahead of the competition. Because one of the interesting things about your work is that, is that you're a very eclectic thinker. You, you've written on lots of subjects, you have lots of ideas across lots of subjects. We know now that you're stepping down from being the Dean at Rotman. So what's next for Roger Martin? What are you going to be working on? Um, I'm going to be working on the future of democratic capitalism. Uh, so I have a concern that over the last probably 10 years or so, there's been more and more critiques of democratic capitalism because it's not producing the results we thought it would. It's produced in the last decade or so two humongous crashes that have been incredibly uh, painful. It's produced a, uh, a less and less equal distribution of income with the sort of the, the median families income not not going up at all. It has you know people will blame capitalist activity on on deterioration of the environment of of the the globe. So I'm I want to ask the the question. Are there ways that we can take democratic capitalism and tweak it for the better? Because I always worry that if you've got a system and the system isn't producing the results that people would like, they'll try another system entirely. And I do subscribe to the view of capital, uh, you know, capitalism. It's uh, and democracy is the, it's you know not a, not a perfect system, but it's it's uh, it's better than all the alternatives. So that's what I want to uh, want to do is 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 try and come up with again actionable actionable uh, uh, steps that we can take to make sure capitalism is, f uh, is functioning the, the best possible. And so that's what I'll spend the next five-ish years uh, working on. Well, at least you've taken a small subject area to study. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Just a little, 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 little tiny one. You know, and, and, and that is, a, that is an interesting strategy question. That's a, there's a where to play, how to win. In that entire huge debate, what, what I have to figure out is what's my where to play and how to win, and in that case, how to add, add value. And, and so it, it's, a, it's a good point. I, I have to figure out a way to cut into that issue in a way that at a relatively small scale, uh, we can add some, some real value. So that, that, that's my strategy test for the next, for the next six months uh, before I get started on that July 1. Well, we wish you luck with that. Roger Martin, thank you very much. It's a pleasure as always, Des.